Okay, so um, welcome to Anusha Krishnan's uh, thesis defense. Um, so I'm chairing, I'll have uh, Lorena introduce Anush officially. So the format is that uh, we'll ask Anush to give us a talk for about the next 45 minutes or so, after which we'll have open public discussion. Um, at the close of the open public discussion, then we'll ask the most of the audience to leave and the examining board to stay behind. And we'll have the closed part of the, of the examination. So with that, uh, Lorena Barbara, I'm very pleased to have her back to Thank introduce you, Anush. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, Anush um, comes from uh, IIT Madras, if I say correctly. And uh, he's been with the group since 2009. We're very happy uh, that uh, he's uh, now graduating and going to a job. He's going to be working in EXA as a CFT uh, engineer. And so he's staying in this area. And uh, we're very happy to congratulate him for, for his new job. And uh, he and Christopher are the last two members of, of my group here at Boston. I'm glad to be back and uh, uh, see them off to their bright new futures. And uh, uh, I know she's is, is a, is a very uh, knowledgeable about computational fluid dynamics, and uh, he's been um, uh, working in both an analysis of uh, the CFD. Uh, method called immersed value method, as well as writing his own code uh, for, for a few years now and uh, applying these codes to some interesting aerodynamic uh, scrolling. So, uh, without any more details, and Anush. Thanks, Lena. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, especially thanks to our committee, Professor Grace, Professor Bird, and Professor Yakot for, uh, for agreeing to be on my committee. Um, so, yeah, as uh, as Lerner mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been working on immersed boundary methods, which are a class of techniques in computational fluid dynamics. And I've been looking at both analysis and applications of these methods. So uh, what are immersed boundary methods? Just to give a basic idea. Actually, I'll start with what fluid, computational fluid dynamics is. It's basically simulating any fluids on the computer. So it could be like the aerodynamics of a, of a car. Or it could be like the, the I mean the the, uh, the 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 flow behind an insect wing as it's flapping. So that's really unsteady and complex flow. And uh, or, or it could even be like blood flow inside your heart. Basically, anywhere there's a fluid, gas, uh, or liquid. Uh, what we essentially do is we have the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the governing equations of of fluid dynamics, and uh, we try to. Uh, yeah, we, we try to solve these equations. And since they usually don't have analytical solutions in the general case, we need to uh, use some simulation techniques so that we can get numerical answers. And so uh, obviously, when we, when we solve for a flow field, we want the velocity and the pressure everywhere. But because we don't have infinite memory in computers, we need to use something called a computational grid, which is uh, you, you, you select certain points in space, and you solve your equations at those points. And so you get your velocity and pressure at those points. And uh, so you can see here, this, this grid looks fairly complex, because this is also uh, a complicated geometry, especially near the uh, engine exhaust. And uh, so and, and the, the, just generating this grid is actually a fairly complex task, let alone solving the nearest stokes equations after that. So. Uh, this is a typical grid used in computational fluid dynamics. So you have the fluid, which is where the grid is generated. And then you have the solid regions. And you solve the Navier-Stokes equations in the fluid regions on the grid. And uh, but what immersed boundary methods are is, uh, yeah, sorry. You, you can see that this grid conforms to the body geometry. And by that, I mean like the, the borders are at the solid interface. Uh, but with immersed boundary methods, what happens is you, you can choose a simple grid. So in this case, it's a Cartesian grid. And it's very easy to generate. I don't have to care about what the body looks like. And I solve my Navier-Stokes equations everywhere on this grid, except I would make some modifications to those equations near the solid boundaries, because I, ne I still need to satisfy the boundary conditions there. And uh, so the advantage with this method is that grid generation is very simple. But the difficult part is to make sure that you uh, satisfy your boundary conditions correctly at the interfaces. And uh, I mean, that's that's why it's called an immersed boundary, because you have the boundary that's immersed in your grid. And uh, you can see the advantages of this kind of method. Uh, 
So suppose you have complex geometry, as we saw earlier, or if you have moving geometry. So let's say you started, you're, you're, you're trying to simulate a flapping uh, flat plate like this. And then after a while, it moves there. And then your, your mesh starts uh, losing. So there's mesh quality. And, and, and if your mesh is too skewed, it's not going to give you the right answers and things like that. So you can see here that the mesh gets pretty skewed. Whereas in an MS boundary method, your body and your grid are completely are defined completely separately. So uh, what you're going to do is you, 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 you're not going to change your grid, and there's not going to be any loss of quality there. And you don't have to keep regenerating your grid at every time step, which is, like, like I said, could be a time-consuming process for some geometries. So um, yeah, so usually what uh, immersed boundary methods do is they have a Lagrangian description of the body, which means you follow the body, and an Eulerian description of the fluid, so which is you, you look at properties at the specified locations. Right? And uh, so how these boundary conditions are usually satisfied is that uh, so you, you have your uh, body, which is just a set of points, a Lagrangian points, as I mentioned. And uh, you, you solve your Navier-Stokes equations everywhere on the grid. But at points near the boundary, you add an extra forcing term uh, to the Navier-Stokes equations. And what this forcing term does is it, it tends to bring the velocity to rest. And so you need to choose the right amount of force to, so that you, you uh, and I, I talk about rest here because I'm talking about the no-slip condition, which is the boundary condition used for most viscous flows. And this forcing term usually has the form, uh, it's it's a convolution with the delta function, but over the surface. So what it ends up being is a singular force that's on the surface. So you have the force that acts exactly on the surface and nowhere else. And so, but how much force do we have to apply? And this is actually the very first paper that introduced Emma's boundary methods. And in the beginning, this force was literally calculated by a force. And so they modeled their bodies as a collection of springs. So this is like a hardware or a model of hardware. And you have these springs that extend or contract. And uh, based on the spring constant, they generate. And uh, you can transfer this force back to the fluid. And then uh, you, you move the points with the velocity of the fluid. And so that uh, satisfies the no-slip condition by itself. And later, when they wanted to start simulating rigid bodies, what they started doing was they started increasing the uh, force constant, uh, the spring constant. And uh, this, so that you, you kind of got a limit towards a rigid body. But then what happened was when, when they did this, you, you started having stability issues with your numerical schemes. And you had to use really small time steps, and it became impractical. So uh, what they started doing was they started calculating these forces uh, in a deterministic way uh, instead of using these elastic models. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about first is uh, one of these methods called the immersed boundary projection method. And uh, so this was developed by Tyran Colonius in 2007. And what they did was, so you, you, you have your Navier-Stokes equations. So the first two are what I've already showed you. And the last one is just uh, a convolution of the velocity field with the delta function at the location of the boundary, which should give you the velocity at the boundary. So what you're essentially saying is the velocity of the fluid equals the velocity of the solid, which is the no-slip condition. Now, I, I can discretize these equations using a finite difference method. And I can, even, I can write them in this form. And uh, I'll actually explain more clearly what this means. So u and phi are all vectors. And A, G, all the cap, uh, cap letters are matrices. How these come about is, so uh, like I said, we need to first mesh. And uh, our, our mesh is something called a staggered grid. So it is a Cartesian mesh. But the thing is, the, the x component of the velocity, which is u, and the y component of the velocity, v, and the pressure, phi, they're all computed at different locations. So uh, this is done to, I mean, uh, there are lots of advantages for this, like conservation to properties and uh, even uh, and avoiding uh, numerical uh, oscillations. But uh, this is uh, actually a very common way of solving the flow. And uh, what happens is uh, you, you, have, you have your, these are the velocities that you're solving for, these, these discrete points in space. And so you can arrange all of them into vectors, right? And so you have a vector of pressures and you have a vector of uh, velocities. And now, uh, let's say you want to discretize your equation. So you have 
Uh, for example, you have a second derivative term here, which uh, this is the common finite difference form of the Laplacian. And you can write it as a matrix vector form. So uh, you take all the coefficients, put them in the matrix, and these are your velocity values. So uh, you, you can do this for every single term. And so and, and you, you have this huge system of equations that you assemble from every, at every point. And uh, so that's, that's basically the discrete form of the uh, momentum equation. And uh, I also wanted to talk about the delta function. In, in an analytical sense, it's a singularity. But when we use numerical methods, we need to use a special form. Like it's, it's a smoothed out delta function, which as you refine the mesh, it gets sharper and sharper. And this is how it's usually defined. I mean, it, it looks something like this in two dimensions. And what happens is uh, we have the force that's on the boundary point. But when you convolve it with a delta function, it gets spread because it has a fixed width. Uh, and so it gets spread onto your grid. So you have your force at the boundary, which goes into the Eulerian grid, which is used in your navier stokes equations. And uh, so now that we can discretize our equations like this, so this is the continuity, divergence of u equals boundary conditions. And uh, so when I say boundary conditions, what happens is some values of u are known, the values on the boundary. So all of these are all of these don't have to be solved for. So you push them, you push them onto the right hand side. And similarly, all the explicit terms, that is, um, that is values at the time step n, and you are solving for the time step n plus one. So all those explicit terms go to the right hand side. So the convection component of the Navier-Stokes equation goes to the right hand side, for example. And uh, so you, you now have your unknowns, which are the velocities, pressures, and the forces on the body. And you have the system. And you can actually solve the system directly to get your, uh, the vela all of those quantities at the next time step. But the thing is, this system is really, uh, I mean, it's, it's an indefinite system. And you can see that it has a lot of zeros on the diagonal. And that's really bad for iterative solvers. So what you would do is you, um, what, uh, let me first uh, make some, make a few transformations to this equation. So you can you can uh, I'm not going to details for this, but you can transform this equation such that all those matrices uh, become like this. So so it's a symmetric left hand side, and then you can combine sub matrices, and then you get a simpler system like this. But again, this is also indefinite. It's it's the same system, but uh, with uh, certain uh, scaling re rescaling done to it. So that left-hand side matrix can actually be factorized into these two matrices. And um, now, if you knew A inverse exactly, we could, again, solve this uh, system. But of course, we don't know A inverse exactly. That's the whole point. And so now, uh, after factorizing the left-hand side, we combine this matrix and this vector into another vector. And this is a quantity which we call the intermediate velocity. So Q is like a, 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 the flux, which is the velocity times the area. So um, now we have another system. And actually, from these equations, we can write, I'm sorry, from these systems, we can write these equations. So we can first solve AQ star equals R1. And then we can solve the system that uh, Q transpose Q star minus Q transpose A inverse Q lambda equals R2. And then we have Q star defined from this uh, multiplication over here. So suppose we do solve for Q star first, and then lambda, and then Qn plus 1 in these steps. We can actually see that this is probably going to be simpler than solving for the original system directly. Because uh, A here is the matrix that's set up through the diffusion. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, it consists of the time stepping term and the diffusion, implicit diffusion terms. So it's actually a pretty well conditioned matrix. It, it can be solved easily. And uh, for certain, I mean, again, I've not discussed A inverse here, but suppose we did find an approximation to A inverse, this system will again be uh, positive, definite, and uh, symmetric. So that is actually going to be easy to solve as well. And so now we, we get QN plus 1. And uh, so, of course, we need to address the issue of A inverse. We don't know what A inverse is. Uh, but we do know what it looks like. And uh, like I said, it consists of the time stepping term and it consists of the Laplacian. And uh, why I said Laplacian is, okay, I forgot to mention that uh, the diffusion term is, uh, is uh, discretized using a Krank-Nicholson method, which is an implicit method. 
So you have the uh, the diffusion term, of course, is a Laplacian term, and so you you take half of the uh, half of the value at the time n plus one and half of the value at time n, and you sum them together and put them in your equations. So which means the velocity is solved implicitly. So when you have a a to be, I mean, when you have a hat to be of this form, you can write the approximate inverse as i delta t because you can you can write you can expand this into uh, using the Taylor's expansion, and this will be the first order. Uh, approximation of A inverse. So, and you can see that A, A inverse here is a very simple matrix. It's, it's just a diagonal matrix. It's an identity matrix times a scalar. And so, calculating Q transpose B and Q here, where B n is uh, the nth order approximation of A inverse, is going to be really easy for the first order form. And actually, this is this is the form that has been used traditionally in CFD. Um, but uh, I'll get to that in the next slide. But basically, my point is now that you know an approximate A inverse, you can solve these equations easily. So the first equation, you have an intermediate velocity, which need, may not satisfy no slip at the boundary, which may not satisfy continuity. So you have a second equation, which solves for your pressure and, uh, and the force on your boundary. And then you project that pressure and force onto your velocity field to get a velocity field that satisfies both continuity and uh, no slip. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if if you don't have an inverse boundary, then you don't have your F, which is a force, and uh, you only solve for pressure in this step. And then you get your velocities in the final step. And so this is this is what the equations are going to look like. So you have the divergence and the gradient, and uh, uh, instead of Q transpose and Q, and these equations are actually the same as uh, the equations on the right hand side, which I've written, which are the traditional fractional step method or projection method, which which is used in uh, widely used in computational fluid dynamics. So actually, this is the reason why it's called the inverse boundary projection method. It, it what it does is it takes the interpretation of the fractional step method, which was actually introduced as a splitting technique, but it analyzes it from a completely discrete perspective. And it, yeah, it interprets it as uh, an LU decomposition, which is what I showed earlier. And the advantage of doing this analysis is one, I mean, you, you, you figure out a lot of properties. You figure out, for example, that it's a first order approximation, uh, which isn't entirely clear when you split it. And when you, uh, when you actually solve these uh, equations here, you need to have boundary conditions on phi and U star. U star is this artificial quantity that we introduced. And uh, we don't know what its boundary conditions should be. We have to derive it numerically. And uh, phi, again, is not really required. And we don't really require the pressure boundary conditions because Navier-Stokes equations should be solved just with the velocities. So all of that is extra effort. And uh, there have been some con the, some papers that have talked about how to derive the boundary condition for U star and things like that. But when we set up the Navier-Stokes equations in their original form, we take into account all these things. We take into account the boundary conditions, and we have our matrices, and we just need to put our matrices into that, uh, into those three equations, and then we, we get our solution. So I went into detail for this part because it's going to be useful in a later section. Yeah. So I missed the part. Why do you need boundary conditions for you start? I thought that the idea was that you got rid of them. Uh, so. Sorry, uh, you got rid of the boundary? No, OK. So what I mean by boundaries is so you still do have the, I mean, you have an entire domain within which you have the inverse boundaries. So you still need boundary conditions on the domain. Nice. But moreover, you also need boundary conditions for U star on the, uh, on the body, because uh, you will have to, wait, let's see. No, actually, yeah, you don't. But you do need the ones. and. Okay, so actually, this this will also require boundary conditions on the body when you want to calculate that term. So, um, so the the idea here is now we have the projection method, which is a popular technique in computational fluid dynamics, and we have an inverse boundary method, which is directly based on it. And so, uh, and and it it has the same form. So, we'd like to take this idea of having a general projection method, and uh, and 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 I, I, we wrote our co code based on this idea. So 
I, I have these general equations, and all now I know that for the for the pure uh, fluid with just the navy series equations, I can choose certain values of Q and A, and I, I'll be able to uh, solve it. And then for the immersed boundary method, I just have to modify Q, and I, I if if I already generate G in my Navier-Stokes solver, then I only need to generate the E transpose part of it. So this this becomes a code that is easily extensible, and uh, I mean it, it can apply across uh, various immersed boundary methods. And so I just have to inherit. For example, I write this as a base class, and I have to inherit that, and and make some extra modifications. And I, I actually leave this part of the code untouched because that's going to be common to all the methods. And so. Uh, this this gives a nice framework, and we we wrote our uh, uh, we uh, wrote the code uh, based on this framework, and it's available on GitHub right now. And so we had this code, and then we were yeah okay. So th these are the kind of problems that you can solve easily with immersed boundary methods. You just have these moving bodies that are arbitrarily moving, and um, and I don't have to worry about anything. I just uh, prescribe the motion in the code and take care of everything. And then we validated it. These are values from Jane Wang's paper, 2004, and those are our simulation. And so, yeah, we had this code, and then we were looking for an interesting application to uh, apply to. And uh, so we came across these flying snakes, and uh, wait, not those, but um, <laughs> these. Okay, so these are. Yeah. Where, you know, where you have the cylinder and, and things. Yeah. Uh, was the cylinders rejected prescribed? Yeah. It was prescribed. Yeah. Yep. This is this is the stress. Yeah. Because because in general you have to file you have to uh, evaluate. That's true. I mean I ha I don't have fluid structure interaction in in the code. Okay. It's it's all prescribed motion. That's right. right. Mm. So these flying snakes are found in uh, they're found in Southeast Asia, and they are uh, fascinating because they actually uh, the, the same motion that you see snakes do on the ground, which is like the undulation, they do in the air, and they're able to literally glide. Uh, I think the best glide performance is usually 10 meters from a 10 meter tree, but the thing is it drops vertically for a bit, and then. It gains speed, and then you have a very a pretty shallow glide angle towards the end. So this is typically how it uh, glides. And uh, so how it does this is it flattens its body, and by by opening up its ribs, and then uh, it it gets this kind of airfoil-like shape. Uh, it's actually very bluff for an airfoil, and and they do define it as a lifting bluff body. And uh, and it has to be. Uh, symmetric, of course, which is not like usual airfoils, but this is this has to be because as it undulates through the air, the front portion of one part of this uh, snake becomes the back portion when it turns. So uh, that that is kind of a requirement. And uh, so there are experiments that uh, Holden uh, and uh, company uh, Jake Soka and Paolo's from Virginia Tech they conducted these experiments on that unique shape. And they looked at the lift curves. And uh, so for different angles of attack at various NR numbers, they uh, ran these um, uh, experiments. And, and they found out that at angle of attack 35, for NR numbers beyond 9,000, you saw the spike in the lift coefficient. And the, the thing is that their experiments weren't uh, resolved enough to be able to look at what mechanism might be causing that. So we thought it might be an interesting problem to look at using our code. I mean, our code is 2D, but we still thought, I mean, we, we, we weren't sure what to expect, but uh, we still threw our code at it. And uh, we did it for a range of Reynolds numbers from 1,000 to 3,000. So it's a different range. Uh, again, like I said, we weren't sure what to expect. But then what we did see was we, we also observed the same spike in uh, Reynolds at, at angle of attack 35. And so uh, so maybe there's a link. I mean, that, that that's our. Uh, is it the same Reynolds numbers? No, those are not the same Reynolds numbers. So, yeah, it's. Um, what was the Reynolds number over there? Uh, it's uh, around 9,000. Hmm? 9,000. Hmm. So, uh, we saw the lift coefficient, and then uh, obviously, if uh, looking at the, I mean, the, the surface pressure for a bluff body is the main component of the force. So, 
we looked at the surface pressure and uh, uh, we saw this big depression uh, in the surface pressure at angle of attack 35 and uh, so we were we needed to look into the flow field to explain that and what happens at angle of attack 35 is that we see a separation i mean you can, uh, and it's it's clearer here but we do see a separation at the leading edge but the, the unique thing is that this separation doesn't lead to a stall and so because the flow does separate though there is a strong vortex that is generated on the dorsal side and vortices are associated with, with low pressure so when you have a strong vortex with lower pressure on the dorsal side that's going to decrease the pressure and increase lift and uh, i mean uh, in all other cases you can see that the flow is attached uh, at, at all times uh, for for uh, lower angles of attack or lower Reynolds number and so yeah that, that is basically uh, uh, our explanation and uh, i mean uh, like i said this this uh, we, we wanted to use this as a lead in for uh, future work and we think that uh, and and uh, i've also seen other work presented at conferences which use this idea of a leading edge vortex at again for for a similar shape uh, airfoil uh, at certain angles of attack that that seem to spike uh, increase the lift coefficient at certain points so we do think that this is a a fairly good hypothesis and uh, we published our work based on this uh, in physics of fluid okay so um as I mentioned, we, I, I was writing this code, and I did say that the code was extensible, and we could incorporate any kind of direct forcing method into this. And uh, so that's what I tried doing. There's a, uh, and I, I mentioned how there are these direct forcing methods for rigid bodies where you calculate the force in a deterministic manner. So we already discussed the immersed boundary projection method. And uh, there is another uh, popular immersed boundary method called the direct forcing method. And so I tried putting the direct forcing method into the code. But let me first explain what the direct forcing method is. So you start off with the projection method. This is how the equations are written uh, in a standard form traditionally. And this is how the projection method is written and solved. And uh, uh, Fadlon and company in 2000, they just decided to take these equations, add a forcing term to the equation which solves for the intermediate velocity, and then solve the rest of the equations. And uh, again, the purpose of the forcing term is to enforce the no slip condition. So, how, uh, how how do you? Okay, so an, an important point about this method. Uh, we earlier talked about how the force was a singular distribution all, along the boundary, and this uh, it had to be uh, transferred between the body and the uh, grid. But here, actually, the force is directly applied at every point on the grid and is applied to the discretized equations it actually has no meaning in the continuum form whereas in the other method it did like it, it, you had a you, you could talk about a singular force distribution in the continuum form and in the discrete form but here it exists only in the discrete form and how is this uh, force uh, where is this force applied so earlier it was determined by the size of our spreading delta function, right? But here we actually pick the point where we want to apply the force. So what is what is uh, what, what they chose to do and what is typically done in uh, direct forcing methods is that you take all the nodes that are adjacent to the boundary and that are in the fluid, and uh, the, the nodes that are closest to the uh, closest to the body are the ones where the force term is applied. And the nearest Stokes equations are solved uh, everywhere else, just the way that they are, uh, without the force. So, and the next question, of course, is how much force do we add to um, to to? And a simple way to write this is uh, you have u star, and this is the expression for u star, and you want u star to be the velocity of the body. So, you back calculate the force. And then uh, you you know you want u star to be u b, which is the velocity of the body. Back calculate the force and then put that back in, and then you can calculate u star. And uh, of course, but that was simple if the body always coincided with the grid point, because all those equations are written at the grid points. And uh, of course, in a mass boundary method, that's not usually the case. 
these are the points where you want to apply force, but these are the points where you want to satisfy no system. So a very crude approximation could be that I just set uj to be uv. I mean, it's, it's close to the boundary, so maybe it's the same value. And so your representation of the body is kind of this jagged staircase-like thing. And this is a first order approximation because your interpolation is basically just uh, giving the same value as the nearby point. So it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a constant interpolation or a first order interpolation. Uh, or you could, you could do linear interpolation, which is actually one of the more common things to do. And this was this was this is the exact method that the paper by Fadlon proposed, which is you take the adjacent point that's in the fluid, and then you take the point in the body, and then just linearly interpolate it between those two points to get the value at uj. And this is expected to be a second order convergence because you're using linear interpolation. And so uh, the uh, we've not talked about the force, and now that we can calculate it. We can always solve these equations. And uh, uh, so, uh, but what are the problems with this method? So one, I mean, it's uh, they just added the force to the uh, first momentum equation without uh, considering any effects on the other quantities, like conservation of mass at the boundaries and uh, how, how these equations would be modified if you just added a force. And uh, that's something that they didn't uh, that they didn't deal with, and uh, which uh, which actually, as a later paper by Kim et al. showed, um, the mass in fact is not conserved by this method at the boundary. And another problem for me, and which I think is uh, uh, is that it didn't fit in this framework of the projection method. And that's actually, I mean, it, it's it's not it's not like I'm saying it's wrong, but it's that if it doesn't fit, then that means that there is no consistent discretization of those set of equations, which can be solved as a projection method. So uh, it, it, I felt it was important to, uh, to write down the equations in a way that was consistent and uh, which, which, would, uh, which, which could be derived in a discrete form. So uh, another thing I want to point out is uh, this is a slide that I've already shown you before. But I, I was talking about how the force is calculated by uh, putting UB uh, in place of U star. And then back putting the force back in the first equation. But when you do that in an implicit way, you're going to get back the interpolation relationship. So the forcing in a direct forcing method is you're not adding an extra force. What you're essentially doing is you're solving the Navier-Stokes equations everywhere. And in points where you don't know, I mean, uh, where you're not solving it, which are these forcing points near the boundary, you're just performing an inter interpolation. So you're like, I know the solution everywhere here. I don't know the solution here, so I'll just interpolate from the body to the solution there. So that's, I mean, this is, this has been pointed out in later papers. Uh, I, I, it, it, it wasn't explicitly mentioned in the first paper, but it's been realized later. And, uh, and um, uh, I, I guess the whole idea of a force is for historical reasons. But I, I, I prefer not to see it that way, at least for the direct closing method. And uh, yeah, and this uh, this relationship, of course, is true even when I'm doing a linear interpolation. Here, I've only looked at the constant interpolation. But if I substitute this there and then pull it back in, you, you'll again get the linear equation. So, so yeah, as I mentioned before, what you're going to write down when you write down your discrete set of equations is that you're going to write down the momentum equation. I mean, sorry, yeah, the Navier-Stokes equation everywhere. Uh, and then at the boundary points, you're just going to write down these relations. And so that's how you set up your uh, system that I spoke about earlier, your discrete system. And uh, uh, so, the, the, but the difference between this and the standard Navier-Stokes system is that, of course, the rows of A that correspond to the boundary points are going to have these relationships, and they're not going to have uh, all the other convection terms, diffusion terms. And rows of G that correspond to the interpolation relations are zero because there is no pressure involved in the interpolation. So, um, yeah, and uh, I also divide throughout by delta T here because we have uh, divided by delta, you divide all diagonal terms by delta T so that when you want to use the approximate inverse of A, of A which we earlier showed was I delta T, 
you you just use i delta t. So that, that's why we divide throughout by delta t. And how the continuity equations are um, set up. And this is something that we actually have borrowed from the paper by Kim et al. And what they said was, uh, uh, you, you can only conserve mass if the flux is due to the due to the velocities that are interpolated are neglected. So it's like in this cell, you are only looking at the mass conservation in this portion of the cell, and you neglect the parts that are due to the uh, due to the interpolation. And so when you usually would write the sum of fluxes and the sum of fluxes on alpha sides to conserve mass, uh, you would you would change that at cells near the boundary to use only the only the fluxes that don't, that are not interpolated. So now you have a new system of equations. Uh, in terms of the symbols, it looks like the old system, but as I mentioned, it has these differences in the rows of G and in the columns of D now, because uh, the columns of D are zero because uh, they correspond to the fluxes that are interpolated. And uh, so uh, the, the approximate inverse is the same as before. And we now have our fractional step method for the direct forcing method. Now, what's the difference between this and the earlier method? Like, what's the difference between this and the one that was uh, proposed by Carlin? Uh, the the main difference is the the second equation, which is which I said was uh, which, as I mentioned, was untouched by Carlin. And uh, uh, but but here you can see that there is a there is going to be a change. This is this is the standard Poisson stencil. And this is what it would look like for, in the method by Carlin et al. But in the current method, when you calculate the G transpose G, which is actually divergence times gradient in the previous uh, 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 slide, it's going to look like this. Uh, these relations are for a uniform grid. Um, it's going to look slightly different for non-uniform grid, but for, for simplicity's sake, I've chosen a uniform grid. And uh, so what this means is that certain certain terms are zero. And if I set phi i plus one minus phi i as zero and phi j plus one uh, and phi i j as zero, uh, in this equation, I get this equation. So essentially, it's like this equation is this equation plus these boundary conditions. So we, you'll see that Fadlan et al. didn't consider any boundary conditions at the inverse boundary. They just neglected that part. And uh, uh, in, a, in a fractional step method, uh, you do naturally get uh, boundary conditions on the pressure at the at the domain edges. And you, you see that it's Neumann boundary conditions at the at the at the domain edges, and but but no such uh, thing came out of the method by Carlson et al. Whereas it, it naturally comes out here, and um, and uh, I mean I, I think in in some sense that makes it consistent because when you are applying uh, a, a, a boundary condition on the velocity, you need to also take into account how the pressure would change. And uh, but but here of course when when and there are other a few more things that are. Uh, nice about this. So a lot of people used to worry when you when you dealt with inverse boundary methods and you are solving the Poisson equation throughout the domain, you have it's a Poisson it's an elliptic equation. So every point of the domain affects every other point. So you now have flow that is inside the body, which might be unphysical, which could possibly affect the flow that's outside the body, which is the answer you want. And uh, what this does is it kind of separates the systems. So you now have two Poisson systems that you're solving, one inside the body, one outside the body. Both of them have Neumann boundary conditions at their, in, uh, at their interfaces, but they do not affect each other. And uh, so what this means is, uh, yeah, so yeah, what this means is that you, you, you don't have that issue anymore of, of solutions affecting uh, the, the outside. And uh, in, in terms of practical, uh, I mean, in terms of how things change practically, so when you solve an equation with Neumann boundary conditions everywhere, you need you have you, your your system is going to have one zero eigenvalue. So you need to pin a value at some point because uh, yeah, yeah otherwise you you can get an infinite number of solutions for Neumann boundary conditions. But now you have two systems, so you need to pin two points. You're going to have two zero eigenvalues in your system of equation. So you need to pin a point 
Okay, we ended at that side. So, uh, so yeah, now I've, uh, I've, I've now I've, now that I've uh, developed this uh, new numerical scheme, we need to test its convergence properties uh, just just to make sure that uh, the sanity check. And uh, so what I did was uh, okay, this is actually my base Navier-Stokes algorithm. Uh, and uh, that's without any immersed boundary in it. Again, a sanity check just to see that it's working on it. It's give me second order convergence road, which is good. And uh, so uh, now I have. I'm, I'm trying. Uh, this is this is a this is the test problem that I've used to check for convergence. I have a lid driven cavity, which is a canonical case, and you have a square cavity with the lid moving at a particular velocity. It starts from rest, and then the flow starts. It starts turning around because it's driven by that lid, and uh, uh, that is actually the test I use for the nearest of solver as well. The difference here with the inverse boundary is that I have a circle on the inside, and that's my inverse boundary. And uh, and of course, when I test for my convergence, I'm only looking at the solution in this area because you do expect the solution on the inside to be unphysical, uh, and and I do only care about the solution on the outside. So I was looking at uh, uh, and as I said, we, we used a linear. In, uh, I didn't mention, but we used a linear interpolation for uh, for enforcing the no slip boundary condition, and we observed that the we do expect a second order convergence because linear interpolation is supposed to be second order, but we got values all over the place, and this was a little uh, uh, not not very uh, comforting. So uh, that that annoyed me a bit, and it it also led me to do a lot of things, uh, but. I'm actually uh, a little suffering. Yeah, it was engendered by those numbers, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Can you describe what you mean at the, the starting bit size? Okay. Yeah. So I didn't explain that. Yeah. Okay. So, how I calculate convergence is that uh, I uh, so if you have second order convergence, what that means is, let's say I'm using a grid with the cell size h, mm. and for a finite difference method, you expect that as you Define your mesh, which is, in other words, you're making your edge smaller and smaller. So as you get a bigger grid, you expect your error to go down. And by error, I mean the error between the analytical solution and your numerical solution. So this is called a convergence. How how your numerical solution arrives at the analytical solution. And uh, when you say second order, what that means is if your edge reduces by half, then your error reduces by one fourth. Basically, whatever ratio you reduce by, your error reduces by the square of that ratio, and that's a second order convergence. If you had a third order convergence, it would, it would reduce by the cube of that ratio. So um, what, what I do here is I start with an initial grid size, and it's 20 by 20. And uh, then I define it, uh, I triple the size. I made it 60 by 60. And for a second order convergence, I would expect the error to go down by nine times. And actually, for this problem, I do not know what the analytical solution is. So I cannot calculate the error directly. I cannot just subtract my uh, numerical solution by my analytical solution. So there are formulae where you can you can derive how to calculate the uh, rate of convergence from solutions on three successive grids. And so that's what I did. I used 20 by 20, 60 by 60, and 180 by 180. Calculated the solutions on these grids. And then I took the points that are common to each of these grids. And then I looked at the difference between the solution at those points, which are common to all these grids. And so when you look at the difference in the solutions, you can see how the error. Uh, again, you can take the L2 norm because it's 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 a vector. It's it's uh, you you do multiple differences all over the uh, all over the grid. So you take an L2 norm of that, and then you see how that changes uh, as you refine the grid. And you can use these values to calculate your order of convergence. And well, I used four grids, and the first uh, first column. Uses the first three grids to calculate the convergence, and the second column uses the next three grids to calculate the convergence. So these are the finest three grids, and these are the these are the coarsest, so, uh, next fine, next finest, and the next. One. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't explain that part. And uh, so I, 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 since I was, um, since my Navier-Stokes solver works fine, and it's only my direct forcing method that's having a problem. So I thought there was. Maybe there's something uh, weird about the way the linear interpolation is performed. So I, I took out the Navier-Stokes part of it and, and just looked at the diffusion. And uh, this uh, and 
when I did this, I got I I saw nearly second order convergence. Uh, these are pretty good numbers for second order convergence. So have you have you tried anything but three dimension? Uh, but three D. Yeah. Oh, for this method, I haven't. So then, then so when, uh, when everything is good, basically you're saying that everything is good for simple two-dimensional situation, yeah. and without changing uh, no no fluid structure. No fluid structure. Yeah. Because the, uh, this method was invented uh, by Peskin to. Uh, to get into fluid, fluid well, it depends. The, the method by Peskin is a fluid structure in, interaction, sure. uh, but but when these uh, direct forcing methods were introduced, as uh, they, they don't necessarily involve. They are not by default fluid structure interaction. In fact, they are by default not fluid structure interaction. And uh, uh, I, it's it, yeah, I I agree that the original method by Peskin was. I mean, that was his intention. But uh, things. I mean, th like I said, this is uh, for a rigid body. Uh -huh. So this was not even intended uh, to be that in the first place. So have you, have you tried three-dimensional case? Uh, not for this method. I have done that for the inverse boundary projection method. But uh, I, but I wasn't doing any analysis for that part. I was just doing the three-dimensional cases for solving flows. And uh, and actually, I think this, this shouldn't, I mean, these results shouldn't really matter if it's 2D or 3D because uh, these, like, like I said, this is just looking at the numerical method and its shoot, behavior. They never, they never shoot, but they always do. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, when I did the diffusion problem, and here I'm using the same linear interpolation. I'm using a direct forcing interpolation to force the temperature. I mean, a diffusion problem. It could be interpreted as temperature or yeah, anything that follows the heat diffusion equation. Um, and so something, so it's 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 not wrong with my uh, something not wrong with my linear interpolation. So it has to be with my nearest Stokes equations. So and then it, it struck me that uh, what was happening was I was uh, the the method resulted in these uh, these uh, gradients to be zero, and these gradients were essentially evaluated at the interpolation nodes. And so uh, what what was happening was my I was performing a linear interpolation for my velocity, but my pressure gradient boundary condition was being applied at the interpolation nodes. So that ended up being a first order. Uh, that ended up being only first order accurate. So my pressure was being first order accurate, and my velocity is being second order accurate. And so that was giving me these all of these values in the middle, depending on what the body where, where the body was with respect to the grid. And uh, so, uh, and 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 how, how do I fix this problem? And, I mean, and uh, I mean, once I realize this, it's actually fairly easy if you think about it. You already have uh, you're doing a linear interpolation for the velocity, so all I need to do now is a linear interpolation for the pressure gradient. So I, I have my pressure gradient at this point, and I want it to be the linear interpolation between the pressure gradient at this point and this point. I'm sorry, at at the boundary and this point. And um, and uh, so for for uh, direct forcing, I'm sorry for projection methods the pressure gradient at the boundary is uh, is zero that's a first uh, first order in time accurate uh, boundary condition for the pressure and so my pressure boundary conditions just reduce this uh, instead of zero i now have these values and these are my interpolation coefficients and i can put these in my uh, poisson system and then it's going to look like this it doesn't look like the system that we derived with the discrete direct forcing method, and it doesn't look like the system that is the standard Poisson sensor, which is one one four one one. So, it's a uh, it's 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 a uh, it, it now depends on the interpolation coefficients. And if we use this equation in our pressure boundary conditions, we see second order convergence with the uh, uh, with with the uh, direct forcing method. So. Basically, what happened was, um, uh, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, th this and uh, since I'm uh, since I was now modifying my pressure equation directly, obviously it didn't sit well with me because it didn't fit my position with the framework. So uh, I realized that was obviously there was a, there was an alternate way you could derive the same thing. Uh, earlier, the the method by Kim et al. They suggested that you neglect the fluxes due to uh, the interpolated values, but Instead of um, instead of that, what you can do is you can replace the interpolated values with 
the interpolated values. And uh, you, you can write down your uh, divergence equation this way. And uh, so now if you have your D, D matrix, which looks like this, and then you have your G matrix, which is generated the usual way uh, with, with the empty rows uh, corresponding to the interpolation uh, locations, uh, you can now uh, your, your D times G matrix, which is your which is used in the pressure solve, is going to look like exactly like the matrix that we showed earlier. And so what this kind of tells us is, uh, in retrospect, it seems obvious because it, Kim et al were asking us to neglect the fluxes at the uh, at the interpolation ones. And uh, well, that, that sounds like it's a first order approximation for the velocity. So they were using a linear interpolation, or they were using a bilinear interpolation uh, at for the velocity for the velocities in the momentum equation, but in the continuity equation, they were using a first order approximation for their uh, for their uh, uh, velocities. So it, it turns out that the fix that they uh, suggest is actually first order, and that affects the solution. Uh, yeah, that was basically my comment. And uh, so yeah, and this this sounds fairly straightforward in the way I put it, but. It took a long time, and I had to. I, I took a lot of detours, wrote some bad codes, uh, and so in the meanwhile, I also had to. Uh, I had to spend time when those things were failing. I had to start writing a 3D solver, uh, which. Uh, uh, <coughs> so this is this is a 3D solver, which of course we need to uh, solve more complex flows, and uh, which. Um, uh, yeah, which is based on the immersed boundary projection method that I talked about in the beginning. So this this hasn't I haven't implemented the direct forcing method in this uh, code yet, uh, but it, it uses the original projection method that I was talking about, and it's 3D and parallel has to be kind of parallel because memory requirements shoot up for 3D problems, and uh, I use the Petsy library for all the uh, sol for the solvers and uh, and the uh, the stencil codes. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've also validated this code with, uh, for example, flow over a sphere, and I get uh, the drag coefficient value very close to the experimental uh, experimentally observed results. And uh, I also did that for the flat plate. And uh, and since we need to go go, go forward with the, oops, okay, yeah, since we need to go forward with our snake work, I just ran some uh, proof of concept tests for. For the snake class section, and uh, this is at the number three hundred, um, and uh, this was just a snake-shaped body, which uh, which uh, sheds vortices as flow uh, moves over it, and this is the top view of the same thing. It's actually a pretty cool simulation. You, you can see that the uh, tra uh, the the vortex on the ventral side uh, detaches much quicker than the vortex on the dorsal side, and there's some. Pretty interesting interaction there. So yeah, and uh, that concludes my talk. Um, uh, basically, so I just want to summarize uh, the things that I've done and uh, what what is probably new in this work. Uh, we I, I wrote this code that was based on the idea of a general projection method, which any immersed body method can be incorporated into, and uh, I used this code to study there uh, the 2D aerodynamics of the cross section of the of a flying snake, and we observed that uh, when 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 there's a leading edge, what I'm sorry, when there's separation at the leading edge, but without stall, you can see an en enhancement in lift. And then I uh, developed a discrete formulation of the direct forcing method, and then I analyzed it and I, I I saw some problems with it, and then I managed to fix it and make it completely second order accurate. And uh, I showed that the fix that by Kim et al, which, uh, which is actually fairly commonly used, is uh, is only first order accurate in, time, I mean, in, in space, and uh, also in a 3D parallel immersed body method code. So, um, I'd like to open the floor for general questions. Can your framework be easily extended to add a turbulence model to do? Yeah, it's it's a, actually turbulence models are very easy because they are explicit terms. So uh, where whichever kernel calculates the explicit diffusion convection terms, you just add a turbulence model. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. You simulated the snake at Russell Road 2000, yep. and you said that the experiments that you were simulating against were around 9,000. Yep. Why, why the difference? So, uh, I mean, OK, so there is a fundamental difference between two dimensional and three dimensional flows. Uh, for, uh, even if even if I have like a cylinder and a, let's say infinite even if, even an infinitely long cylinder in three dimensions is going to have uh, instabilities in the streamwise direction, and the flow is going to be fundamentally different from if I simulated that in a, using a two-dimensional code. So um, yeah, physically uh, I I don't even expect the problems to be uh, the same, but this was more like a initial. Uh, uh, like I, I, I like I said, we weren't expecting anything in the beginning, but we just saw made this observation, and we think that it might be related to the explanation for the three dimensional. But can you explain about the lift enhancement and and when it appears in the two D and three D simulations, and why those are different or related? Um, so I mean, the, they are related in some sense because it looks like there's a threshold above which uh, above which the spike appears. And that's th that threshold uh, is not the same for both cases, but um, it, it. But um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually can't. Uh, uh, I, I, they, they are. I mean, the, the flow physics is, are different for two D and three D cases, so I, I, I actually can't uh, comment on that. But you can see that you observed the lift enhancement at lower Reynolds numbers in 2D. Yep. You didn't say that. So oh, okay, yeah. It's, uh, it's 2000, and, yeah. And there's an there's a explanation for that. In 3D, you have other instabilities that come into play there. Yeah, but I'm not sure how that will affect with, with respect to Reynolds numbers. I mean, we can't really make a comment on that. You can't but what you see is that the threshold is, lower is at higher Reynolds numbers in 3D. Oh, can I ask a different general question? Um, so you showed us two different projection methods. One that's the, um, uh, uh, pro sorry, immersed boundary methods. One that's the projection method and one that's the direct forcing method. And um, you implemented both and worked with both and you figured out how to fix the direct forcing method. So now it's as as good as perhaps the, the projection method, as, as good as the projection method started perhaps or, or maybe better, I'm not sure. So which would you prefer in, if, if, um, if, uh, if, if you had to, if, yeah. Which would you prefer, and why? What are the what are the pros and cons? Okay. So yeah, this is actually a great question. Um, so, I it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, uh, the, 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 if you if you remember the immersed boundary projection, the first one that I talked about, we had this system that we solved, which took, which solved both the pressure and the force simultaneously, and that's actually a it's it's a it's a coupled system, and the matrix is not like well behaved. Uh, and it, it, it's actually going to be much slower to solve than the matrix that we would solve for the direct forcing method. So that method is going to be slower, and in that sense, it's going to be it's going to be bad for you because your code is going to run slowly. Uh, but if you have moving bodies, there are lots of studies that show that uh, the the delta function spreading, where you, you you treat the body as a as as a set of Lagrangian points, and you spread the force from the body to the grid, which is what we do in the first method. But in the direct forcing method, we don't do this. And in fact, the body is, in some sense, it changes shape at every time step, if you assume a moving body. Because you're only going to look at where the grid intersects the body. And you're not following individual points. And the body is not defined by those points. It's defined by where the grid intersects your body. And that, of course, uh, again, will depend on how you discretize your body, whether you use linear or some beast line to, uh, uh, to describe it. And uh, what studies have shown in direct forcing, with direct forcing methods is for a moving body, uh, unless you do some special, uh, uh, unless you make some special changes to your numerical method, you're going to see these spurious oscillations in your uh, force coefficients. And so the direct forcing method is, uh, uh, as on a, an, a basic form of the direct forcing method, is actually not as good for a moving body as a method that uses the delta function spreading. Uh, but if you were to study only stationary bodies, then you would probably want to use the direct forcing method because it's going to be much faster. But if you're studying moving bodies, you would want to use the other method because it's probably going to be more accurate. Well, thank you. You know, I teach here uh, uh, sometimes. 
<laughs> and uh, usually in numerical project I give students, uh, you know what, uh, uh, draw a craziest air uh, airport you want and let's see what, uh, ha what happens to the uh, uh, lift condition. And trust me, so, uh, they did. Oh, they always do this craziest uh, air point, and some of them are very similar to what we showed here. Uh, and these uh, uh, 30 degrees and uh, 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 leading edge vortex are observed always, but no one ever observed decrease of the uh, lift condition. So, are you telling us that uh, you can uh, that all you have to do is to, uh, to get a foil and fly it with 30 degrees of angle of attack and you'll get it? In the real thing, you have two very important uh, effects of wish: three dimensionality and time, and, and time dependent. Yep. The, when uh, the snake flies, it does something yep. like this. And the snake is not stupid. Uh, uh, they do it for reason. Uh, and, uh, and we know very well that in the ocean, uh, 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 fish, and uh, uh, they, they always produce something time dependent, which is of importance. So, uh, do you do you still believe that uh, uh, in, in a steady flow, fast airport, you can get uh, 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 effect which is uh, which is real? So I, 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 I guess I didn't mention this part, but we are not using this as an explanation for why snakes generate so much lift. Oh, cool. So, so well, then I take one, then it's, it's, take it's, this, 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 it's more like this problem has been inspired by the snakes because, uh, so it's like this, uh, like you mentioned, the snakes motion is very complex. It's 3D and it's moving and it's, uh, uh, and this is like a stationary uh, rigid, I mean, the snake itself might be flexible. Who knows if it maintains that shape throughout the journey? Exactly. So, uh, it, it, this is it's it's more like a very theoretical problem that has been inspired by the snake and is more like a stepping stone towards the final explanation. And hopefully, like maybe if you get an advanced enough code, we can actually simulate the moving, which which you should do with. Time your thesis is application to the snake. Yeah, but a very basic application. The experiments that you were comparing to yeah. the stationary, uh, stationary uh, uh, sections. sections. They are not. They are not moving geometries. Other general questions. Let's thank Anush for an interesting presentation. <laughs> I'd like to invite